You don't even have to take beginning psychology in high school to hear about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's kind of everywhere in our culture, that image of the pyramid of needs that in a way shape our desires. At the bottom, we have physiological needs for food and water, warmth and rest. Then we have needs for safety and security that are next up on the pyramid. After those, we have needs for belongingness and love needs, intimate relationships and friends. Above those, we have esteem needs, prestige and the feeling of accomplishment. And finally, at the top of the hierarchy, we have self-actualization. Maslow devised this pyramid in the 1940s, and he did it by studying. He said he didn't want to study people who had problems, pretty much. He wanted to study the people he saw at the top of the pyramid, people like Jane Addams and Albert Einstein, people who had lived very fulfilled lives, and how did they get there? How did they build that pyramid? Since he wrote this, it's been critiqued from every direction you can imagine. One of the main critiques that came immediately is that that's a very individualistic way of looking at what need means, that only in a very individual-centered culture would that be true, and that in collectivist cultures, the top would not be self-actualization. It would be much more uh, collective living out of service to others, which of course, in the people that he chose to look at is what self-actualization was partly about for him. But, but that need to serve others that he's identifying comes from your need to do it, not the fact that that's what we should be doing. And so it doesn't really matter if you need it or not in a collectivist society, the needs of the group come first. So those were some of the first critiques that were leveled. In the 1970s, two people named Waba and Bridwell did a, an assessment and a whole lot of study. And in their opinion, there was no validity to this hierarchy. They saw that there was no empirical evidence to support this hierarchy of fulfilling needs. I think that's really interesting. Then in the 1980s, some social scientists posited that needs were developmental and a lot more developmental theorists had been working by then from a variety of perspectives. And they said that actually the way they saw it was for children, uh, safety and security and physical needs are the most important. Uh, but that they actually reversed some of them. They said that the love need, the need for love, comes out from childhood to young adulthood. And then in young adulthood is the highest level of need for self-actualization. And that actually old age had the highest level of need for security. So they, they suggested that some of these were out of order and that it certainly didn't work as a developmental way to look at need. So then in 2010, a bunch of people redid the hierarchy. They just said it wasn't right, it wasn't complete. They left the bottom couple layers as they were, but then while the original hierarchy had five levels, the new one had seven, and they got rid of self-actualization altogether as the top. They suggested that it's interesting, but not fundamentally a need. And maybe that's where need and desire do branch off from each other, at least in my individualistic mind, that maybe self-actualization is a desire and not a need. And to hear that actually there isn't any empirical evidence for that is very interesting to me. So I, of course, have spent my life interested in spiritual desire, spiritual longing, spiritual fulfillment of need. And so I look at these, of course, you know, the saying, if a person is hungry, then bread is God, is absolutely true. So if you, if you don't, if you're out in the cold, if you're starving or you don't have anything to drink and you're, you're dying of thirst, self-actualization is going to be getting a drink, getting warm, getting fed. Of course, that's what you desire most. And for people who 
have lived in starvation have told me that that's really all they can think about. They, their mind can't focus anywhere else. They are only worried about dying of starvation and focus completely on getting food. But as we look at the evolution of desire to fulfill spiritually, I'm more helped by the Hindu stages of life. Now, let me just say that I am completely culturally out of my depth with this. I don't know, but I didn't grow up Hindu. I just learned about this when I was young and studying Hinduism in college, and I always thought it was just a good framework to think from, for me. It may be very elitist, it may be very class-based, caste-based, but I still find it more helpful actually than Maslow's hierarchy. So let me share with you what these things are. They're called ashramas, and there are four age-based life stages that are discussed in the texts. So the first one is student, and that I think is when primarily our goal in life is just to learn how to be in the world and how to be here. Then after student comes householder. Now obviously there are class biases in that, but if you don't think about householder as now it's time to buy a house, but you just think about where your energy when you're young and parents are providing a stable place to be, ideally, then you move to a stage where you need to create a place. You need to create a space. You need to create a house of some kind, a home. Then they say retired. Now retired again, in, uh, in Hindu culture, in medieval Indian texts, I have no idea what that meant. And I have no idea what age was associated with it. But because for me, retired, and then the last one is renunciation. Now renunciation can be preparing, preparing to die. And of course, this leaves householder as this huge stage of life, which is, you know, 40 years now, 50 years. <laughs> But I still find these helpful. I find it helpful to think about how as we age, our desire does shift. That, that what happens, they say, for the older people is that they're more into being and less about doing. Why this is so important to me is that I feel like our culture is so grounded in capitalism that at the point at which you cease to produce something meaningful, you are identified as meaningless or because of class or other reasons, if you never have the ability or the option to do something meaningful, you are seen as meaningless. In Hindu culture, I believe in what I've heard about India is that there's much more of a sense of spirituality, though certainly capitalism lives there now too, but there's much more of an inherent sense of spirituality that respects the qualities of being that come with older people. And, and I say this because recently I was talking to an older person who told me he wished he was dead because he's of no use anymore. And I said to him, I didn't know you were such a capitalist. Like, why isn't loving be, of being of use? How, so many of us love you. Why isn't that being useful to love and be loved? But in our culture, that last stage of life is not seen as valuable. Now, the Hindu people correlated these stages of life with the proper goals of human life. And those were dharma, righteousness and moral values, so living a moral, righteous life. Artha, prosperity and economic values. Kama, which is pleasure and love and psychological values. And moksha, which is liberation and spiritual values. And I just like a system that goes to moksha, which goes to liberation. And for me, that has to be collective liberation because there is no individual liberation. As Dr. King said, no one is free while others are oppressed. And of course, we're not gonna see that in our lifetime, but to have that time of being, to be a time of kindness and love and desiring above all, the well-being of all that, you know, may all be held in loving kindness, may we all be held in the heart of love. I think that is desire. That is, as I age, that becomes every day more and more my deepest desire. I know that I speak from privilege. I'm not in the cold. I'm not worried about food and water. 
But the fact that that desire is in no way named or valued and that people holding that desire are not valued to the point where someone would say, I'm not doing anything productive when they are holding that love and intention for the world, there's something so broken there. So as we think about desire this month, all of this winding around and looking at systems is just to say that I think it shifts over time that what we desire of course is a product of our culture and our privilege and all kinds of other things, but it's also, I think, about our consciousness. And that's what I'm most passionately interested in, is what, as our consciousness evolves, what do we desire? What do you desire as you find yourself evolving as you are today? <laughs>